Okay, thanks everyone. Um, welcome to the, the afternoon plenary session here at the conference. Um, this session is entitled The Future, The Now. Um, and this session is sort of based off uh, what was a, a well-received session at the Toronto conference uh, a couple of years ago in which we invited people who are sort of working in, in the, the hub of social marketing as, as sort of emerging researchers and practitioners um, to share their reflections and thoughts on what are the key issues and what are their perspectives on social marketing. Because um, we probably hear a, a lot from, you know, the, the sort of thought leaders, um, but there's a lot of interesting ideas, you know, at, at, at that level as well. Um, so we've got four um, excellent speakers th this afternoon. Um, first of all, we've got Kathleen Chell, who has, you know, even at her young age, has got multiple um, social marketing personalities. Um, she's a PhD student at Queensland University of Technology. Um, she's a social marketing researcher and works on quite a few different projects. Um, and also, she's a great support to me um, with the AASM, the Australian Association of Social Marketing. Um, and Kathleen's a very active um, committee member of the management committee for the association. Um, secondly, we have um, Irma Martam, who's a director of the Pule Foundation in Indonesia um, and is also a partner of Toledo that does a lot of work in the Asia-Pacific region on social marketing interventions. Um, third, we have Dr. Sinead Joan, who's a, a, a postdoctoral fellow at National University of Ireland uh, in Galway. Uh, and then finally, we have Dr. Thomas Anker, who is a lecturer in marketing at the University of Glasgow in my hometown, so way Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, you know, sort of uh, introducing the session, so I'm, I'm just really going to break down, uh, you know, what, what it's going to be about, and then we'll hear from our excellent speakers. So as I mentioned, uh, this special session follows up on the successful Future Speaks session in Toronto. Um, now, our panel of social marketing academics, practitioners, are going to discuss some of what they see as the key issues and challenges in the field. Um, and in recognising the innovation and new ideas, um, and also the, the fresh thinking that emerging social marketers have got to offer, um, the speakers will present and discuss their key issues that they identify for social marketing, um, based on their own experiences, but also relating that back to the bigger picture, the, the big fish that we've been talking about in this conference. Um, and what will happen is each speaker will come up, uh, come up and give about a 10-minute presentation. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a, you know, quite a bit of time, probably about 40 minutes or so, um, for an interactive question and answer session. So a bit more time you know, to ask questions and to get a debate going. So hopefully that will that'll be good. Um, so basically, I'd encourage you to, to listen carefully, to um, support the speakers, and then think of you know, debates and questions uh, and things that you want to ask um, once they've spoken. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kathleen Chell, who's going to start off the session. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, okay. So when I tell... Oh, wait, sorry. Firstly, so my presentation is more on reflections on preparing for social marketing careers, so I'm drawing mostly on my student status and how I look to or how we're going to need to build a career in social marketing in the future. So when I tell people that I'm completing my PhD, generally I'll get three comments back. Firstly, so you're going to be a doctor? Yes, I will be a doctor. The second, oh, and when I'm injured or sick, oh, you'll be right, you're a doctor. No, not that kind of doctor, please help me, I don't know what I'm doing. Lastly, I get the comment, oh, you're going to be getting the big bucks now. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Earn a university degree and get a good job. This is the formula that has worked with relative success for the last 50 years. But increasingly, this is no longer the case, particularly for postgraduates where supply is far outweighing the demand. This is particularly true within social marketing where which has evolved beyond a definitional stage um, and as an emerging field to an established discipline. The progression of change in postgraduate expectations over the last 10 years is quite substantial, just within that short time frame. Once upon a time when you wanted a job after completing a postgraduate study, you only needed the degree and you were almost guaranteed a job. 
Then you needed publications, 2009, and the degree, and that could guarantee you a job. Then teaching, or a degree plus research experience, as well as demonstrating teaching experience, that could get you a job in 2012. Now we need all of this plus high-ranking publications, not just any publications, and as well demonstrating engagement and service with industry. So no longer can we just focus on a degree. It's essentially catch-22. We need to get experience to get a job that will give us the experience that we need to get the job in the first place. So how do we actually get a job now? Well, my own experience, I, my involvement in social marketing started by volunteering at the International Social Marketing Conference just as a timekeeping volunteer, uh, where my supervisor put me in contact with the then Brisbane hub lead for the ASM, and who I then got in contact with and started doing a bit of the administration and communication side behind the events that were held in Brisbane. This then expanded to me helping with interstate events and then helping with the International Social Marketing Conference in 2014, and which all of my involvement through the events gave me, or I was awarded the title of events coordinator with the ASM, and then through additional involvement with other varying projects, helping out on the committee, I was then invited to be the student representative. So it's kind of a, started off just by making contact and with my supervisor helping me progress, and then my involvement increased, and so, now I'm where I am. I had a similar um, progression through my ex or research at QUT through the blood service. So again, my supervisor put me in contact with a research fellow at the blood service who I was then going to uh, work with, with my honours research. I then kept in contact, worked in additional projects with them, made um, good relationships with those who were working in the division that I wanted to work with, and now I've got a part, permanent part-time employment with them as well. So that's a one day a week position. Um, similarly, doing guest lectures in my first year and then moving into tutoring and social marketing. So it's kind of started with small opportunities and then I've kind of progressed into broader areas. But this is just, um, this is my pathway, but it demonstrates the extent of additional work that students now need to be competitive to get a position. We can't just rely on our own research and possibly some teaching and publications. The whole other side of it. Um, a key point to note though is that while I've been able to make the most of the opportunities given to me, um, I wouldn't have got the chance without my supervisor first you know, introducing me and presenting me with these opportunities that I can then gain further experience. So, can I get a show of hands? Who is an academic in the room or has some supervisory role? Yep. Who are the practitioners in the room? Awesome. And who are the students? Okay, perfect. Well, I have a message for all of you, each group. Firstly, a message to the senior academics in the room. With an established career and a network of contacts longer than my Facebook friends list, you are in a much better position to see as well as be notified of these opportunities that could be or prove to be valuable experience for your students. We don't have those connections yet. We rely on you to identify those opportunities. And although I haven't been a victim of this, when I say valuable work experience, I don't mean being as your personal assistant. These are valuable work opportunities that will develop our skills. We need your support, guidance and mentorship to identify projects to work on, connect with industry partners and prepare for a career in social marketing. You play a crucial role in how we develop in our career and how we plan our career and even identifying pathways for our career. So please keep in mind that we really need your support. Be a mentor, not a superior. Secondly, a message to the practitioners in the room. This is your opportunity to utilise our student status. We are only students for a certain period. Make use of that before we start charging ridiculous consultation fees. <laughs> we are the more cost-effective option for your projects. 
Social marketing students are willing and motivated to learn, but at the same time, just because we're students doesn't mean that we can't do the work that's required of us. We can contribute to strategy formation or conduct research, and we can be a valuable addition to your team. Um, by virtue, and I'm sure we've all seen a few student presentations today and we will do tomorrow, our research contributes to knowledge innovatively. That is a requirement of doing a postgraduate research project um, in emerging fields of interest, which could be a benefit to practice. Um, also, the use of students in practitioner-based projects um, conducting academically rigorous research is one way that we can bridge this seemingly large gap between theoretical-based research that's done in academic world to what practice wants and needs and that kind of thing. So using students to bridge that is a good opportunity as well. Um, also allowing us to engage early with you because as marketers we know that building uh, or maintaining long-term relationships is more beneficial than having to find new blood for new projects. So get in early. So basically we need both senior academics and practitioners to realise the increased pressures on students to gain experience outside of our own research projects and teaching responsibilities in order to be competitive now to get a job in the fields that most of you are working in already. Uh, there is so much potential for the social marketing community to be a lot more collaborative, not only you know, across disciplines working in different projects, but also in terms of support and knowledge sharing. There isn't such a competitive nature as what there are in you know, more commercial settings. Um, it's an opportunity to be much more collaborative. So finally, it's not just a message to the academics and the practitioners, but also to the students. Because this is something that can bother me sometimes, but undertaking additional work outside of your chosen study is not a formal requirement. So don't see this as just something you have to do. But it's an implicit expectation to do these things in order to be competitive. So don't fight against it, just accept it and make time to do other things. You can't just focus on your degree. Take on opportunities offered to you within your own capacity, but challenge yourself at the same time. I'll tell you now, securing you know, unpaid work experience, particularly with an agency context, is really difficult, let alone having to try and get work experience that's paid. So be prepared to start in a volunteering capacity and then prove your worth and then go into a paid position. Be strategic and align with what you choose to do and where you want to be. So having transferable skills outside of just a research base is important. And often these additional projects and work experience gives you these other skills that may be beneficial to future employers, not only within academia, but also within industry as well. You know, the ability to manage multiple projects simultaneously isn't a skill that you gain by focusing only on your particular research project at hand or data collection, or just something that gets us involved outside of our research and teaching. Um, so we'll be looking for those in the room to actually provide those opportunities to us. So look out for an email from me. I'll be, I send the emails if anyone's wondering. <laughs> and so I'll be looking for those opportunities for you to get back to me. So this is a good opportunity for you to realise that we actually need those and it does benefit students a lot in terms of their career progression. Um, so in summary, it's important to realise and accept that a degree is no longer enough to secure a job within social marketing, whether that's in academia or industry. It's important for those who have an established career in social marketing to support those still building theirs. We are the future of the discipline, so you can either support that or be part of the problem. And if the PhD doesn't work out, at least from all my additional work experience, I can become an event planner. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. And uh, as someone who just graduated a few years ago from a PhD, I still remember what it's like and the, the challenges uh, with that. So I hope that everyone in the room that can relate to that or is in a position to influence some of the things Kathleen said, you know, takes takes on that challenge. 
Uh, next, I'd like to invite Irma Martin to come up, um, and she's going to speak about behaviour change campaigns to social transformation, particularly talking about multi-level approaches and gender perspectives. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is my first time in a World Social Marketing Conference, become a participant and now become a presenter. So, um, And thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to present and share my story. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, and that's where I'm currently living and doing my work. Uh, and social marketing approach has been used mostly to promote uh, health be uh, behavioral change in health sector, such as sanitation, hygiene, disease prevention. There are some of a uh, few program as well. Is it correct? To, I, I'm not really using. This is the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so it is progressing. Um, this uh, some of the example that, that the work that I'm involved. So uh, social marketing approach is uh, developing and progressing in Indonesia. And what I would like to present and share the story with you today is based on my experience in using social mas marketing as um, part of gender-based violence program, where it is important that we are dealing with the root cause of the problem. So as the challenge as any other social problems that not only we need to change the behavior at individual level, but it's also dealing with the structure inequalities, power imbalance, and deep city social societal problems. Uh, instead of explaining further, let me take you to a short clip that illustrates the complication of life of women in Papua, which recognized as one of the, having the highest rate of domestic violence in Indonesia. As some of you may know, Indonesia is a very diverse country, uh, an archipelago that consists of thousands of islands, and the situation also very much different from one area to another. Let's say Java Island and Papua is very much different, so segmentation definitely is very important when doing a program in Indonesia. But what I would like to point out in the, the importance here is on the multi-level approach and also gender perspective. So, and then how that I play, is it that one? Okay, so you can see the complication of the life of the woman, which is uh, very much important that the perspective, the gender perspective should be used and also the multi-level approach. <coughs> so the emerging approach in preventing violence against women now is by engaging men at all level. And this is the change of paradigm. Uh, so focusing on the positive message, which is very important 
uh, using this current gender perspective and the power relation between men and women that currently existing. So it is very important to engage men to become part of the solution rather than pos position them as the cause of the problem as previously the most popular approach in the violence against women program. So uh, we are not looking only uh, uh, on this uh, for the change, not at only individual level, but also on, uh, at different level uh, as well. So uh, in this case, the example show that we actually engage men uh, at the individual level and also doing advocacy in the policymaker and also community mobilization, doing community mobilization. So to be able to get this um, transformation, the social transformation, we do uh, at the individual level behavioral change approach uh, and how it is benefited to them and using uh, many ca campaign channel. But we also do advocacy uh, for uh, law and policy and uh, we are also uh, showing what is actually the benefit to achieving this goal in terms of a bigger uh, picture and also we see that how is actually the evidence show that this is actually uh, working. And of course that we need a media advocacy as well. Uh, and in the other part also the community mobilization, mobilization by tra uh, training and capacity building at all levels such as schools, university and community based health uh, center. Uh, this is the example from my program as you see that we're not directly saying or uh, communicating on the prevention uh, for, uh, to prevent violence uh, supported attitude and behavior, not saying it directly, but what we do is uh, by having this fatherhood campaign. Uh, so uh, what we are trying to do is the uh, uh, encouraging the men to be involved to, uh, in childcare and also in household work. Uh, as maybe some of you are not really uh, familiar with Indonesian culture, but it is very much different with here. While in some uh, culture in Indonesia, uh, it, is, it can be considered as an insult well, uh, if men doing the household chore. So that's kind of situation that we have currently. So what we do is fatherhood campaign for uh, the father and father-to-be, and also for the young men, we do the new masculinity campaign. So basically, we try to introduce how uh, to have a healthy relationship and also a, a better self-concept as a man, not always like being macho and strong, but also considering uh, it's okay to, be, to have a soft side as well. So that's kind of things that we are trying to engage. Uh, that's we already uh, mentioned and but that's not enough it's to have an approach a social marketing approach at individual level is not enough but we also need to do this upstream marketing while uh, based on all this uh, effort we show to the government that uh, we actually can do this. So basically, by having a media advocacy and also uh, the evidence, uh, lesson learned that we, we can show the government to have also a policy that support uh, to this change. And as I mentioned, that community mobilization through change agent is also as important. So like this, for example, what they do in one of the village in uh, East Java, they try to encourage men to be, uh, to, to be able uh, to, to cut, uh, to involve in the delivering of the, the baby. So they help in cutting the umbilical cord of the baby. So that's also something that uh, that we try to encourage here. So what we hope that with one behavior, one small behavior, and then they have more uh, knowledge, they get more insight, attitude, and also helping there are more behavior change and then uh, changing their mindset uh, as well. That's what we ho hope to happen. So at, uh, at last we want to show the, the example of how we want to uh, show them the role model by having a religious leader. This is also a documentary uh, doing all this uh, behavior. So we hope that this is 
can be a living example for the people and also encourage them uh, to change as well. Saya kerja di dapur, yang memasak, yang mencuci, yang ngepen, itu tugas saya. Yang banyak itu rata-rata kan ngaji ke saya, Pak. Dia melihat Ustadz itu sedang apa, Ustadz masak, kan gitu. Ayah itu tertular, Pak. Ada kata memang tugas istri itu bisa saya kerjakan, kenapa tidak? Ustadz Nursalin sudah memberikan contoh kebenaran kepada masyarakat di sekitar sini. So what I want to point out here that it is very important that gender perspective is used in social marketing. So the social, social transformation, of course, is still a long process, but introducing the new masculine perspective as well as more feminine perspective for the social marketing program is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. And I think, you know, some of the things that Marta, uh, Emma was talking about there, um, you know, align with what we've already been talking about, about multi-level approaches. But the stuff on gender perspectives and new masculinity and feminine perspectives, something not really we've been engaging with in social marketing. And I would, I would definitely encourage us to do that because other disciplines have to their benefit. I think we need to think outside the box on that. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sinead Duran from National University of Ireland, who's going to talk about partnership working in social marketing. Is it part of the future for delivering long-term social change? Thanks, Frank. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to come and talk um, to listen to our talks today on the future of social marketing. I hope that my presentation will fit in nicely with some of the conversations that we were having this morning about the broad and change of uh, agenda and the need for more transformational um, approaches to long-term sustainable behavioural change. So just before I start, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, to where I came from and how this has informed um, my, I suppose, perspective on the future. I am a postdoctoral researcher in the National University of Ireland on the west coast of Ireland, and I am one of eight um, researchers that are currently doing work in the area of social marketing. Um, all of us were rec recruited by um, Dr. Christine Domigan, who unfortunately couldn't have been here today. And she, I suppose, was our inspiration for beginning our, our journeys in the area of social marketing. I first um, undertook my first social marketing project when I was doing my masters, and what, and since um, that time, so over the span of about the past eight years, um, from my own research, which has moved from obesity into the area of antibiotic resistance, I have seen funding calls um, change. I have um, observed how um, research articles and how practitioners practitioners have changed their approach to developing social marketing campaigns. Um, so for instance, um, I, when I first started um, in the area of social marketing, um, my first job was as a practitioner and an academic in Safe Food, the Food Safety Promotions Board. And when I took up that post, um, they had not a clue about what social marketing was. They were in the business of behavioral change, but it was more at a mass media level. They tried to segment their campaigns um, and were very successful to a certain degree. Um, however, my in input within their organization, I suppose, brought them more into talking about segmentations, about how to have bigger impact um, and how to have more targeted approach to, um, um, to their activities. And I also emphasize the importance of developing relationships and the long-term sustainable approaches to behavioral change. So instead of um, looking at short-term um, once-off campaigns, how to continue them and, and build momentum over the years and, and, um, and, and throughout, I suppose, different phases of the campaign. During that time, um, the, the different funding opportunities that came in through the National University of Ireland, we also seen the more um, community development model becoming more uh, important within our research. And um, Dr. Um, Christine Delarge, De sorry, um, has been doing a lot of work in the area of community social marketing. And more recently, some of the work that myself, Christine and Patricia um, McHugh have been working on is how to look at a problem, analyze it, and how to um, adopt a systems-based approach to, approach to change 
Um, so instead of moving from the looking specifically at the individual, it's how to engage all levels within the system simultaneously in order to um, facilitate long-term so social change. So when I was asked to give this talk this morning, the first question that came into my head was, how can social marketers create a healthy society? So when you think about the types of problems that you're being approached with, how are we going to find the answers to these problems? So if you look at the social marketing literature and the, even the conversations we're having this morning about how campaigns are developed, we can see that there, the, the, there is an evolving um, breadth and depth to the social issues in which we are trying to address. And there, are, there is a continual behavioral versus social change debate. Now, these conversations have been started by the, pi the pioneers um, of social marketing, the likes of Linda Brennan, um, Ross Gordon, and Christine Donegan, Professor um, Jeff French, to name but a few. And it's about how can we continue these conversations into the future and have an impact on society. But this conversation isn't actually that new. Um, back in 1995, um, Goldberg um, called for a radical approach to, to um, social marketing and social change activities. So at this point, I just want you to think about the types of social issues that you are addressing on a daily basis. What target markets or target audiences are you trying to engage with and the strategies that you're trying to um, 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 get them to, the strategies that you're trying to implement in order for them to, um, I suppose, drop, adopt more positive um, behavioral or social changes. But then I want you to take a step back and see how your activities fits in with the bigger pictures of the social challenges that are facing social marketers. So gone are the days when we were trying to solve the simple problems that, um, that existed, such as how to um, provide contraceptives um, in the developed countries. We're now faced with issues such as antibiotic resistance, which is the area in which I'm working on currently. Um, how to stop the obesity, cri uh, obesity crisis that's taken over the world. But these are, I suppose, more traditional problems. We're now broadened to, um, to include marine sustainability, even world peace, world poverty, um, and global warming. And we need to think about, okay, is it possible for one person or one organization to solve these problems in the short um, sh with short-term interactions? These are what we call wicked problems, and that's something that we discussed this morning. They're very difficult to define. They, are, they cross the boundaries of sectors, um, um, sectors and even levels within the social system. And what we also find is that they're evolving problems. They keep getting worse. Um, and one of the problems is we might have found a solution to the problem, and then we see that the goalposts have changed in terms of how we, we're trying to address them. Um, so the area that I'm looking at at the minute is um, area of antibiotic resistance, which you'd think would be a simple problem. Just tell the doctors to stop prescribing antibiotics and everything would be okay. But that's not the case. What we found from our research is that um, doctors are very aware of the issue of antibiotic resistance, but it's the patients that are demanding the antibiotics from them. How can they say no? It's the two-tier health system in the Irish health sector that's also co uh, contributing to the problem. 30% um, of, um, of patients that visit a GP um, have free medical care. 70% pay 50 euros every time they want to see their GP. So if a patient comes and has um, specific symptoms and um, the GP has a sense of guilt, wants them to walk away with something to make sure that they have value for their value and bang for their buck from going to the consultation. It's a business for the GPs, and you can't criticize them for that. But what you also need to be aware of is the fact that there's antibiotic resist or there's antibiotic prescribing in agriculture. If you talk to health professionals, um, they say, well, what about the vets? Are you doing any work with the vets? So although we're looking at, I'm trying to change behaviors in one area of an entire system, excuse me, um, the other areas are having an influence on them. So if I go back to the other, um, to the example of the GPs, if a patient walks in and receives the antibiotic at this time, they have their ex expectation to receive it the next time. So you're building a, a norm, a cycle of norms. If you go in um, to a GP to, um, with certain symptoms, you might receive an antibiotic if it's a Friday evening. But if, the, 
if it's a Monday during the day, they're like, oh, you might be okay. We'll see what, we'll see if what you can come back with. You also need to think about, um, in this example, um, George, which I got from the Huffington Post, is that um, we share bacteria. So um, although I'm consuming an antibiotic, if I go home and I engage in, in activities with my friends and families, um, they also are exposed to the antibiotic um, resistance bacteria as well. So by um, going about your daily lives, you're also increasing, um, increasing our exposure and increasing the problem. So where do you start? Um, in my view, one of the issues that we need to think about and prioritize more within social marketing is the area of partnerships. We need to think about how to expand our network and the influencers that are, are involved in, in these change activities. As social marketers, we, don't, we normally have engaged with when a certain level of stakeholders um, within our change activities, but we need to broaden our horizons to look at traditional and non-traditional stakeholders. We need to take a step back from looking at the, the problem that we're trying to address. So in my case, the issue of antibiotic resistance and the quality and quantity of prescribing to see how this fits in with the broader system. Okay, what part of the health systems are influencing it and how can we overcome these? So the project that I'm working on, the Simple Project, has engaged um, for the first time with multiple sectors in order to um, facilitate behavioral change and social change. So instead of just working with the more conventional stakeholders, um, our team has social marketers, epidemiologists, health economics, economics um, microbiologists, general practitioners, uh, and um, we also have um, patient influencer groups in order to um, in order to try and determine how to develop change over a long term. So although the, our, pro, our, our um, intervention was focused at um, changing, I suppose, individual behaviours, we also developed a community level by ensuring that um, GPs are, um, that all the GPs within a practice are, cha are, change are creating behavioural change simultaneously um, so that more norms and expectations are developed as well. But in order, to, um, in order to develop partnerships, I think sometimes it's a buzzword. So in a, in when we, we're in a resource deficit uh, economy, um, what we find is that people try to partner with um, organizations that they don't really know or understand um, because they need to um, get an intervention over the line, um, which is a good thing in some cases. In other cases, it's not. Um, and I would like to su suggest some of the key characteristics of what a partnership could consist on based on my PhD research. So the first um, element or first characteristic that should be, um, that should be um, a part of any partnership approach is that there's a joint long-term shared vision. So although you might not have the same organizational objectives, you need to have a common, a common ground or a common um, vision in order to um, to move your um, move your your relationship from the short term once off interaction into the long term relationship um, that you can sustain over uh, in the, into the future, you need to look at your sharing of resources. So you need to know what your key competencies are and where your deficits lie, and try and find partners that um, complement each other. And again, to make sure that um, there's uh, there's mutual benefit um, um, in, in engaging in this partnership. Effective communication, and what I mean by this is that it's verbal and non-verbal. So if you have effective communication within any partnership, you will set out your expectations for the partnerships. And again, this will help decrease any tension or um, difficulties that might arise over the future. And again, it's getting you over the, the hurdles that are addressed within wicked problems. Um, if you have effective communications, although you might have differences in opinion about how to develop your strategy, it's about communicating and talking them through and finding the best strategy to address the target audience in which, you're, in which, you're address, um, in which you um, want to develop your behavioral or your social change. Trust and commitment are central to any, uh, any partnership activities. Without the existence of trust and commitment, your partnership will fail over the long term. And you might have a very good um, short-term intervention, but if you want to have, it, uh, have an impact over the, in, into the future, um, you'll, you may fail dismally if these aren't um, part of your strategy. 
and then mutual benefit. So of course you need um, all parties involved need to get something out of the partnership in order to stay interested in it again beyond the first, um, the, the first phase of your campaign into the future. So in conclusion, what does the future hold? I believe that once after our interventions are not enough to address the wicked social issues that are facing, um, I suppose, the future, the future social marketers. Social change activities need a long-term focus. And I know it, with budget constraints, um, and with budget constraints, it's easier to focus on the short term and the long instead of the long term, but you also need to look at the, the longer term implications of your project or of your project. So for example, um, within the simple project, we successfully um, improve the quality of antibiotic prescribing within our with within our the the GPs that we engaged with, so they improved their prescribing by 20%, so they were prescribing a better, better antibiotics to their individuals. But um, as an unintended consequence, we also increased the number of the amount of prescribing um, that would took place during the intervention because we used a delayed prescribing strategy. Now the jury is still out about the impacts of the strategy and that just because the antibiotic was prescribed, it doesn't mean that um, the, they were consumed, but it's an, un an unintended consequence that you, need to, um, that you need to be aware of. So although we were looking at what our impact was after our short-term intervention, um, we, need to, we need to think, take a broader issue or a broader view of what the impact is overall in society. We need to adopt a multi-dimensional approach, uh, perspective on change that will, that will lead to success. So we need to think about um, broadening horizons and engaging with sectors that we wouldn't have engaged with previously, um, from the traditional to the non-traditional. And I do truly believe that partnerships are essential to successful social change, and they will become um, a bigger element in the future of social marketing. Thank you. Thanks, Sinead, for some really fascinating insights on, you know, how do you do partnerships? We often hear it, well, yeah, work in partnership, but how do you go about that? And I think there were some, some good ideas there. Um, so last up, we have Dr. Thomas Anker, who's from the University of Glasgow, and he's going to talk about consumer-dominant social marketing. I'd like to start with a quote from a recent editorial in the Journal of Social Marketing. How do we, as marketing pr pr practitioners and researchers, take a discipline solidly founded on free choice models of individual behavior and develop new ways of using social marketing techniques to foster social good? In this short presentation, I will argue that the, the underlying principles of the sharing economy offers a new, a new perspective which we social marketers can utilize to redesign uh, our, um, so our, our approach to classic social marketing problems and hopefully thereby gain greater impact. A quick um, short definition of what the sharing economy is. It's essentially about pooling, mobilizing, and structuring excess resources in order to facilitate shared pr production, distribution, trade, and consumption of goods and services in ways that benefit individuals, groups, or the wider society. Well, the sharing economy addresses one fundamental problem, which is in the developed world, there is uh, a, <clears throat> an underutilization of excess resources. For instance, the average uh, power drill is over, the, over, over its lifespan being used between 8 and 13 minutes. In the US, cars are in use 8% of the time. In the UK, uh, each, each year we, we produce 7 million tons of household waste. Now, the, the, the whole point of the, sharing, of the sharing economy is to say, well, all these excess resources, we can utilize them and capitalize on them. As of yet, the sharing economy is very much based on technological facilitation of, of, or, or 
of technological, uh, sorry, of technological like, facilitation of consumer to consumer utilizations of these excess resources. For instance, um, a number of, of uh, smartphone applications have been developed, and I mean, and basically what they do is they connect consumers who have excess resources with consumers who would like to utilize those resources and facilitate a very easy and smooth way in which they can exchange these resources. Now, that's interesting uh, in, a, in a very fundamental marketing point of view if we look at value creation, because all of a sudden it is consumer to consumer value creation, and I believe that is a new type of, of value creation. This slide describes the development of consumer power relative to marketing paradigms over time. If we start with the, the, the first fundamental paradigm, which is the product dominant paradigm, it says that the value um, which are created in marketing is basically embedded within a product. So a product has some features and properties, and it is, and the value that we receive as consumers is by using that product. The product dominant paradigm then emerged into the service dominant paradigm, which we heard about at the last social marketing conference in one of the keynote speeches, keynote uh, talks. Now, the fundamental idea of value creation has changed because all of a sudden it is about co-creation where we as social marketers engage with uh, our target audiences and create value together. So the social marketer moves from, be from being just a value creator to being a value co-creator and a value facilitator. Now in my view, both of these paradigms, they are unable to explain the value creation that is taking place in, 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 the, sharing, in, the, sorry, in the sharing economy. They cannot explain consumer to consumer value creation, exactly because they involve, one way or another, the marketer as being an active part of the value creation. So in the consumer dominant paradigm, we have a notion of C to C value creation, sometimes in, in marketing papers known as value and use, and all of a sudden the, the role of the social marketer is to pool, mobilize, and structure resources. And I believe that's um, a shift. I would now like to apply the basic thinking, the idea of, of the sharing economy onto a classic social marketing case. So let's think of um, illiteracy, the fact that there are so many people in this world that cannot read and write. In, in, in social marketing, we have a, a num we have a lot of examples uh, that demonstrate the traditional paradigms, the product and the service dominant one. A recent one is, for instance, Samsung have sponsored solar-powered high-tech schools in sub-Saharan Africa. They are totally technologically up to scratch. And a good example of how you can uh, try to promote literacy <clears throat> within the product dominant paradigm. The service dominant paradigm is also very much active in the same kind of case, where we or where a number of charities go out and train teachers in the developing world. But what happens if we take the move to, to utilizing the principles of the sharing economy? There is a very, very interesting report from, from um, 2014 by UNESCO called Reading in the Mobile, Mobile Era. A couple of findings from that report on this slide. The main key finding in the report is that illiteracy is large, largely rooted in non-access to physical text. It's difficult for us to understand because we are bombarded with textual messages all the time, but so many people do not have access to physical, sorry, to physical text. And also, there are 7 billion people on Earth, but and 6 billion have access to mobile phones. That means that even in seriously poor communities, there is still this technological um, access. And another astounding finding from the report is that one third of all people in developing countries, they read stories to children from mobile phones. So the main access point to physical text is the mobile phone. 
this slide demonstrates how we could approach this problem by developing uh, a mobile application utilizing the principles of both consumer dominance and the sharing economy. In the bottom right corner, we have the social marketer. And the basic idea is to create a mobile portal which provide access to appropriate textual content via a smartphone application, free, free content, right? Now, in order to, in order to, to make this cost effective, we invite consumers to create stories, to create narratives. There are so many consumers out there who are actively engaged in, in, in writing fictional, fictional narratives, for instance, right? Fictional short stories. So let's invite them to upload those stories to a word cloud, which then can be, be accessed by our, our, for, for free by our consumers in the, in the developed world. So we have both the consumer dominant perspective but also the sharing economy perspective where we as social marketers you mobilize and structure these resources. That leads me to my final slide. We have to stop thinking of ourselves as value creators or value co-creators. Consumers create value. Our role is to pull, structure, and mobilize resources in order to reinforce consumers' capacity to solve their own problems. Are we ready for the challenge? Thanks, Thomas, for some very thought-provoking insights there on the sharing economy and the topic of value creation. Okay, so what I'd like to do for the last uh, approximately half an hour, 35 minutes or so of the session is uh, open it up to the audience, uh, and what we'll have is an interactive Q&A session with the panel. Um, so we have a team of people walking around with uh, microphones, so if you have a question, anything you'd like to address to any member of the panel, um, please just shout for a mic. Um, if you just uh, indicate who you'd like to, to answer your question first, but we'll then invite um, the other panel members to sort of com come on with their um, responses to that as well. Hello, my question is uh, from the woman from Indonesia. Have you looked at um, the role of messengers in, in the work that you do, either at the global role uh, or at the, I guess, national role from a uh, looking at athletes or celebrities who are very masculine delivering your message, or at the local role in having men actually being involved in, in community outreach? Uh, yes, uh, but as I said that Indonesia is very diverse, so we can have, you know, like one, we have actually the ambassador, but uh, we, we need to really uh, careful on using that because you know, uh, maybe somebody is very uh, aspired in one uh, area like in Jakarta, in a very ur urban setting area, but they don't know this person when we come to like uh, Jombang or small city or villages in uh, East Java. So yes, but what we, what we do then uh, is actually finding the, uh, the leader, the opinion leader or the, the com ambassador in the community. So every uh, area have their own uh, role models rather than having one for the all nation, uh, uh, for the same, uh, same person. That's what we do. And yeah, thank you for your uh, input as well. Okay. Any other questions? Put, just raise your hand if you've got a question for the panel. Um, further to that, Irma, I'm just wondering what the structural arrangements were to develop such a comprehensive um, approach to social marketing. Uh, you covered quite a number of strategies and quite a broad approach, um, particularly in that context of a very diverse audience. Can you tell us, for example, where you're from, who your partners, how the resourcing might work for that sort of Fantastic arrangement. Yes. Well, uh, actually, ex uh, in particular for this program, Mancare is actually a global campaign in four countries. So it is in Indonesia, in Brazil, 
in uh, South Africa and in Rwanda. So you can see, but then they, they give us, uh, you know, sort of uh, a loose uh, direction. So how you want, uh, we want to approach in each country. So in Indonesia, we have actually, we don't yet uh, make it national. So we, we do this in four areas. So uh, I myself representing, uh, I'm the program director in Jakarta, where it is very much urba uh, urban. But then we also have it in Lampung, in uh, Central Java, Jogja, and also in East Java, which is uh, very much uh, uh, in a rural area. So the approach in each area in Indonesia is also different. While we in Jakarta using more like talk show, uh, uh, collaborating with the mass media, magazine, something like that. Uh, while in uh, Jombang or in Gunung Kidul, uh, Yogyakarta, we do more uh, discussion in community and collaborating with local government, uh, with the religious leader. So you can see a very much different approach in every, um, in every area. Even we cannot have one brand um, uh, at the, uh, and in each area. Because again, it's uh, very much a different culture and you know, different way to engage with them. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just a question for Sinead. Uh, did you examine any particular models of collaboration? One of the ones that my organization has been using is Collective Impact, mm -hmm. which comes from Harvard Business School. I was just wondering if you'd examined any particular models or come to conclusions on any, the value of any particular models of collaboration. Um, the, for my PhD research, I focused on Morgan and Hunt's um, relationship model. So what I did was I used the constructs that had been already tested um, and validated and updated them within the social marketing literature. But that was the main one that I tested using structured equation modeling. And what I did was I, um, I sent out a, a survey through the social marketing listservs and through the experts um, attending conferences and got um, feedback from different types of social marketers from pr practitioners to academics. So that was the main one that I looked at. Hi, Kathleen. <laughs> Is that the pronunciation? Did you finish your PhD already? No, I'm submitting in October, fingers crossed. This October? Mm -hmm. I'm saying because we are introducing social marketing in our department, it's quite new and just few staff, and we have been looking for postdocs <laughs> today. <laughs> students in here as well. Yeah, we are truly, we put it on websites and everything. We are really looking for postdoc students, you know, who would develop this discipline. So Give I need your card after I'll this. Give me that information, I'll put it onto the website, this platform. Uh, that okay. would be great. So we'll talk after this. Yes, definitely. <laughs> awesome. Uh, in the front here. Thank you, what a wonderful panel. I uh, enjoyed all of them. A uh, question for Dr. Anker. Um, I just was fascinated by the C2C um, discussion that you shared with us. Can you give us any other examples other than the literacy um, space where that's working or being experimented with at the moment? I can't give you any examples of social marketers that ha have actually applied it. So as of yet, it's to the best of my knowledge, an idea which we can run with if, if, if we like. Um, I can clearly see the limitations. So there will be a range of behaviors where it will be perhaps difficult to apply this approach. Uh, but I can also see a number of traditional um, in interventions where we could do it. For instance, uh, a consumer, let's, I mean, if you think of, it could be breakfast clubs in schools. A consumer, sorry, a, yeah, a consumer dominant sharing economy approach to it would, would be to say that instead of, of running those clubs in the schools, uh, the community could sign up so that local businesses could, on any given day, donate, um, pack lunches, which you, you could then, via your app, sign up to and come and collect on your way to school. It could even be 
people, I mean local people from the community um, doing it, their own pack lunches, handing them out for free. Um, I can see so many different ways in which these principles could take away um, some of the, the actions which social marketers at the moment are carrying out and then kind of spread them out on a range of different consumers and where the participation in the intervention would be on a much more voluntary basis. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah, down. Um, Kathleen. Uh, hey, Rebecca. Hi. Hi. Um, this could be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor. I'm curious. Uh, if you had a time machine and could go back to the start of your honours, um, would you have done anything differently knowing now what you know? Could okay. I ask if Kathleen answers that and then perhaps open it out to other yeah. panellists yeah, as well? Yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Well, luckily you asked me that now. Two months ago I probably would have said never do it again, <laughs> wouldn't have done it at all. Um, no, I wouldn't change how I approached it. I've, I think I've made the most of all the opportunities that I've been given, but possibly through that approach, I've learnt a lot of time management skills and possibly I would have done that a bit differently now and maybe not have said yes to so many things and been more strategic about what I did say yes to rather than just all projects possible, this is adding to my resume, this is great, and just take up all my time, but possibly yeah, being a lot more strategic about what I'm actually choosing to work on and in addition to PhD commitments and teaching commitments. But, yeah. any, other, any other comments? Um, if I was going back and doing it again, I would publish as I was going through the PhD process. Because what, what happened to me was I went, did my Viva on the Friday and I started my new job on the Monday. And there's a big blockage there in terms of my PhD publication. So although I'm publishing in the field that I'm working in now, there's still questions to be asked about why I haven't fulfilled my commitments for my PhD papers, which I think are really important. It's just that they were always pushed back down my priority list as I was trying to join all those committees, do my extra teaching, and design a complex intervention at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the thing I would have done differently would be to have a stronger emphasis on working with uh, practitioners all the way along. Uh, I wish I can have a, a, a better conceptual framework at the beginning of this program because it's actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm jumping in the social marketing as a practitioner and I learn here even like only this one day there are a lot of, you know, uh, approach uh, and a lot of, yeah, program that ha have already very advanced and I wish I could, uh, I mean like I'll learn more on that because, you know, even when we start this program, uh, we, they say it as this is a movement and they don't really put it in a social marketing perspective and then I would insist that you have to have this formative research when you uh, start to uh, giving the message to the consumer that's not really the mindset that they have at that time and I wish we have a better plan on that. Okay, great. <coughs> um, yeah, we've got one here and then we've got another question here. Oh. Yeah, okay, we'll start at the back and then next at the front and then here. Actually, I was just going to make a comment, and it's uh, probably to the academics in the audience about what the nature of a PhD is now um, and movement towards the three, four, five paper model as compared to the single thesis. It's getting those publications out early and, and on is, is kind of the, the key name of the game. So maybe there's an opportunity to change the model um, mm. as well. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, front. My question is for Kathleen, and maybe Sinead could provide some input as well. Um, it's good that you had a great um, mentoring experience, um, and I know that because I had the same mentor you do. <laughs> um, but the point I'm trying to make is um, good mentors are few and far between. Um, finding a mentor who really um, teaches you, you know, all the nuances about acad academic life and research and also, you know, um, channels opportunities your way, um, finding someone like that can be, you know, finding gold. 
Um, and a lot of the time that happens by luck, you know, you kind of luck out by getting a really great mentor. Um, do you or does anyone on the panel have any comments or advice for perhaps the, the researchers, the junior researchers or the students who perhaps don't have that good mentorship or struggle to find the opportunities? And, you know, it's not for a lack of trying to create those opportunities for themselves. But do you, do you have any maybe advice on how people in that position um, can maybe find that sort of guidance when it's quite challenging? Oh, well, thank you for your point, Nadia. I agree with everything you said. I'm quite lucky I've got two amazing supervisors that help me out a lot. But I would say have the conversation early. That's why I think it's uh, important for students to realise that the degree isn't enough anymore. And, and when you have that realisation, you can have the conversation with the supervisors you have early and you can get a sense as to whether they're going to be that support that you need and be that mentor that you need to provide the opportunities and help build your career whereas if you have it later on and you realize halfway through your PhD oh now I need to start working in with industry taking on new projects you're already halfway through and you've already established a supervisor student relationship whereas if it's at the start you can see the whether things need to change or whether you need to find someone else. But. One way in which I've developed mentor-like relationships with senior academics is to view um, my papers as an invitation. So sometimes I've been, uh, I've approached people if I had a draft and said, well, would you like to co-author? Uh, the risk is that you might end up with uh, some, free, some free riders, but Sometimes it really pays off, not in terms, for me, not in terms of being invited onto other publications, but in terms of having established some relationships, uh, sorry, relationships to really senior academics, which have taught me a lot. Um, I was very lucky because I had a fabulous PhD supervisor as well. It was Dr. Christine Domigan. Um, I suppose one of the approaches she takes is before she takes on a student, she asks the student to talk to her past PhD students and will give her the PhD student a realistic, I suppose, view of what the PhD process is about, what they need to do and the questions that they need to ask from their supervisor. Um, there were, I've had a couple of um, fellow PhDs who have different supervisors been very upset by their lack of supervision. I suppose there's different types of supervisors out there. Some like you to do more work independently, where others are very approachable. Um, so I think if you have a good support network of other PhD students that you can talk to, um, that's one way to identify, I suppose, who are good mentors and who are the ones that might not be what you need out of the PhD process. Yeah, I think that's some great points there. You know, do your due diligence and don't feel that you're the one that's on the stage and you mm -hmm. have to prove yourself. You're, mm -hmm. You need to also test yeah. your PhD supervisor out and see if they're the right fit. Mm -hmm. So it, it's more of a flat, flatter relationship rather than this such hierarchical yeah. power relationship that can seem quite intimidating. Okay, yeah. I think we've got a question here. Thank you. Well, this is a practitioner question to Dr. Anker. <laughs> um, your model about consumer dominant social marketing is very appealing. And my question is, do you see it applicable across the world regardless of the development level of the country? Because if I understood properly, the principle is a balance. It's sharing excess of food, of whatever good it is, of wealth. And do you think this is applicable in a developing country where excess might not be a concept there? I think you have a very good point that the, that part of the sharing economy which is about utilizing excess resources. That does not apply to the developing world. What I'm fascinating, fascinated by is that the other part of it, um, th that the, the, the technological facilitation of, um, of resources so that they can go from one consumer, say, in the developed world to, to reach to consumers in the developing world, that's interesting. And that is what is, is the case in, 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 this, in, in, in the example I provided with uh, illiteracy, where you have basically you, what, what that symbol app does is that it, it takes text written by people anywhere on the globe, uploaded to the word cloud, and then ex 
and then that is accessible uh, from people in, in, the, in the developing world. So in that sense, it, it, um, depending on how you frame it, I would say that the underlying principles are applicable across the board. Does that answer the, the question? Wondering within a country, okay, a developing country, is there still room for this principle of consumer created value? I could see your point, like from well, a developing um, country, from a developed country to a developing country, but within this developing country, can we think about this kind of model? Um, well, the, the first thing that pops to mind is that uh, in the UK, for instance, these principles are also being used by consumers to share tools. And it could be gardening tools or, I mean, tools like hammers and screwdrivers. And I don't know whether it's the case, but it could ver very well be the case that in a number of developing countries, we still have these res resources which are only being used some of the time and where we can facilitate that more people can buy into these resources by and simply by connecting them, by, by making it, um, public that these resources are there and by facilitating the contact between those who have them and those who would like to, to use them. Um, I would just like to add to that um, one of the connections that I saw between the speakers on the panel was just the concept that even within a developing country or any place where there's an inequality between those that have something and those that don't, I wonder whether there's potential to apply this kind of approach. So for example, uh, gender equality, if we have men, for example, who have uh, a different um, set of resources from women, is there a way that we can use this kind of approach? Or even within groups of men, say those that have changed their behaviour versus those that haven't, is there a way to set up some relationships that would more equally distribute the power or the education or the domestic labour or childcare responsibilities. It's just something that just hit me when you asked the question. Um, for, uh, sorry, uh, first following up on, on your uh, question about the ap applicability in the, in the developing world. Um, one area where it is being applied is peer to peer, sorry, peer, peer to peer finance. So in Kenya, for instance, uh, a lot of people they have in, in rural areas they have now access to financial services via their mobile phone. It's the only way in which they can access it. So, yeah, I, I think there are a, a number of, of ways in which it, it can be applied. Sorry, uh, um, could you uh, recap what you said in the other comment? Um, oh, I was just wondering about we were talking. You first of all answered ah. the question and said it would have to come from countries with resources to countries that don't. But I guess I was thinking within a society, there are people with different levels of access to resources or mm -hmm. power, and whether or not we could be facilitating sharing of, of different ways of more equally distributing those, um, depending on what we're trying to look at. It was just a thought. I also wanted to make the comment, and this might be a little her heretical uh, in this audience, that there are many pathways to a career in social marketing. Um, it may, I, this is the thing that <laughs> I might get slammed for, but may not need to have a, a, an advanced degree to be able to do it. We could actually move into communication companies or research agencies without necessarily having yeah. a PhD. I think a comment on that is it would be really interesting to hear from people who haven't taken this path because that's all we're told at uni is do the PhD, go into academia and that is our pathway but there are other opportunities as well so it would be interesting to hear about those other pathways. Perhaps the next conference. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got a question from Jeff, I think, and then... Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll make a comment on that. So we hire um, the full range. So in, in our research department, we tend to hire more of the, the uh, PhDs and... Do you want to go to San Diego? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think it's easy for Australians to work in the US. I uh, <laughs> have to check the rules there. Uh, but then in the, other, in the implementation fields, we tend to hire pe people with bachelors. Um, and sometimes even without college degrees for 
uh, creative positions. Um, so just throwing that in there. But going back to the developed versus um, developing world on these technologies, have you seen a technology that allows people to come together to make large purchases? So if, if the, the excess does not exist, can you know, five people come together and buy a car and use that same technology to share those assets? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Very honest. I know for a f I mean, I know for a fact that these portals they exist, but whether or not they do exist in, in, in developing countries as well, I don't know. I was just I was just going to say um, the sort of I think one of the biggest barriers for developing countries is probably technology. There's a trend in America at the moment of people forward paying food for those that are less fortunate and whether that sort of model could be used. And essentially, if you're going to buy a pizza, a lot of restaurants allow you to forward pay someone else to get some pizza if they can't afford it. It's a very, very basic example, but it's also a start. Absolutely. And I mean, that ties into sort of building up a, um, a platform which sort of uh, combines a range of different technological uh, approaches. Absolutely. So it's just a point picking up on your ideas about the free sharing economy. Uh, is there potential that that could become commercialised and then it kind of defeats the, the purpose that we've, we're sort of seeing it? Well, it's, it's, it, it is already very commercialised. Um, quite often, I mean, there are like two versions to it. So some of these uh, sharing economy apps are 100% non-profit. Uh, one of the examples I had on one of the slides, I didn't uh, talk about it, was uh, a food uh, swap app where you, uh, if you have produced, um, if, I mean, if you have been cooking food at home and you have too much, you have leftovers, then you can notify via this app in your local community that you have leftovers, and then people who are part of the app, part of the community, they can go to their app and say, all right, I would like to, to, I would like to go and collect those leftovers, all right? So that is 100% non-profit, but, um, of course, there is a number of companies who are making big money on these things. For instance, uh, the ride-sharing company Uber, right? And what the, the, for them, the money is in facilitating the contact between the consumers. Um, so, of course, it's, it's also a matter of, of, of big money. Okay. Uh, I think we've got a question back there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I worked in a social enterprise for a very long time, and from a time when you didn't need to uh, have a degree to do social work, <laughs> and probably that's why we didn't do much good, but I, uh, <laughs> uh, but I sold a lot of handloom fabric, <laughs> and it was extremely satisfying because I felt I was doing good. Uh, and then I moved to academics about four or five years ago. I'm doing a PhD, and I find to my horror that academics want to do good too. <laughs> Some. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, most I've met. Um, actually, the, the question I was thinking about was that when we are talking about marketing and, uh, and, and social marketing, the, the, the big difference seems to be that we think that we are doing good. That's the difference between social marketing and, and, uh, and regular marketing. That we are doing it for the good of people, or we're doing it for the good of the planet. And I think that's something to, uh, since it's not just a transaction between the producer and consumer, because we're also saying the consumer doesn't know what's good for them. Uh, there seems to be a little, I, I, I'm a little bit worried about how we define what is good. In the case of health, for instance, or obesity, it might seem very uh, simple. But if you try to extend it, because you are trying to extend it to other fields, the good might not be uh, so easily, I want. I, that's just something I was thinking about. Yep. Yeah, Thanks. I think that's a really good point. As you know, we know that most modern societies are dominated by power elites who are quite small. You know that the one percent that everyone keeps going on about that hold the reins of power. So, how do we define and control what is social good? Any? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a hard question. <laughs> good question, but a hard one. That was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we can define it. Uh, and I think it ties very much into uh, Shinna's presentation about partnerships. And the reason why so many social marketers are 
very reluctant to do partnerships with um, commercial partners is because of that power balance. But I think that, to me, it's very much a question of not being naive and being very clear about the quid pro quo there is. So if we are absolutely clear about what is it, what, what's in it for them and what's, what's in it for us, I think we can perhaps approach or we can address, we can manage the power imbalance, but I don't think we can make it go away. Any other follow-ups? I think it goes back to some of the, the point I made about unintended consequences as well of some of the social marketing campaigns and about, okay, you can be very good at defining what your problem is and I suppose your outcome measures, but you need to look at the longer term and the impact that that's gonna have. So in our case, the fact that we actually increased antibiotic prescribing, but we weren't trying to improve the quality of antibiotic, or um, improve the quality of the prescribing. Another um, example would be the fact that if you wanted, for example, to um, increase fish consumption within consumers because of the, the nutrients that are involved in it. But then what about the questions about the sustainability of certain types of fish? So although we think that we're doing good, on one hand, we might be taken away with the other. So I think we need to look at our outcomes and goals and look at the bigger picture and the potential impacts that that can have on, um, on our society. Yep, I think this theme of systems thinking is really coming out strongly mm -hmm. at the conference. Okay, we've probably got time for one more question, and it's Jeff, so I think it will be a good one. <laughs> Hope it will. <laughs> Everybody's been really polite so far and asked you nice questions, so here's a couple of <laughs> toughies. Um, for the kind of PhDs amongst you, do you think there's a, because I think there is, uh, a danger with developing a cadre of super specialist social marketers with PhDs? I, I mean, that sounds a bit like closing down uh, routes to top of the profession, if there is such a thing, uh, to other people. So are there any dangers in that? Second question, this is about the kind of consumer-dominated logic model. I can already see uh, the neocons out there rubbing their hands at the prospect of that. Let's just shrink the state. We don't need to do that. Let's empower communities to do it themselves. Uh, this is, you know, <laughs> the way forward. So is there a danger in that model? Okay, so we'll start with the first question about um, pathways in social marketing. Um, so as I entered the job market this July, um, I would say that there is dangers because apparently I'm overqualified for some of the marketing jobs that I want to go into. I'm also been in academia too long to enter some other commercial marketing settings and I've only been out of commercial marketing for about three years. Um, I was very lucky during my PhD process in that I worked full time in a, in a, non, er, in a government agency who funded my <coughs> PhD. So um, I worked in their communications office for three years as I was, um, and, uh, as I was doing my research. But I've, I learned very quickly that although they funded my research, they didn't really care about if I accomplished my PhD or not. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but I was there to fulfill a role. I was there to develop communication plans, to develop strategies, and um, you can do that without a PhD. And I do think that if I hadn't have got a PhD out of it, I would still have walked into a very good job um, without it. So I think there's um, plus and minuses to it, um, and I just think that you need to think about where you want, where you see yourself in the future. But I can safely say that you may become too expert, and that can be a problem. Well, I just think it depends on your expectations once you finish the PhD. I've always been under the impression that I don't expect to get into a high research position straight after the PhD. I still expect to start from the bottom and work my work on the work my way up. So I don't know whether I haven't gone into a job market yet, so whether I'm overqualified, I don't know how that's going to affect it, but it, I guess, yeah, it depends on your expectations of what you expect to be employed for after your PhD. And again, having other skills, I guess, helps in terms of different positions as opposed to just following the one academic career path. The fact is, if you want to survive as a social marketing academic, say in the UK or in Australia or in most other places, then you need to publish your papers in pretty good journals. And the better journals you're going for, 
the more, or usually, the stronger theoretical foundation you need to have. So the internal logic of academia is pressuring academics towards being more and more, um, in that sense, theoretically specialized. What, I mean, the only kind of, I think, what, what, what we should be better at utilizing is the fact that, in the UK at least, there is, in, in, in the REF, there is a very big impact, sorry, focus on impact studies, impact cases at the moment. So our research quality is being measured on our impact. Um, and, and in order to, to sort of move that agenda, we need to be better at working with practitioners. Um, but of course the dilemma is that because we are still becoming more and more specialized and more and more theoretical, that bridge is becoming harder and harder to build. And then the second point was about um, the neocons harnessing the power of the sharing economy. We're lucky to be governed Absolutely. by I mean, neocons Yeah, I, I totally take your point. Of course there is that danger. And of course it will be, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it will be used that way by some people, no doubt. Um, I have two answers to, to, to that, and that is, one is we need to be absolutely clear about the boundaries. What types of behaviors can it be applied to and what types of behaviors can it not? Um, and secondly, even though there is a danger, that does not mean that we should not develop that perspective, but that we need to, to learn to manage that danger. In that sense, it's, it is, it is the same question about power, which applies also to um, partnerships. Whatever we want to do, it, some people would like, I mean, partnerships is the same thing, but that is also sort of a gift for the neoliberals, because then they can say, all right, we need to shift some of, some of uh, the funding onto um, corporations, rather than um, getting, raising that through, um, sorry, through taxes. So, a lot of the things that we are doing keeps pop. I mean, those same problems about power balance pops up all the time. Okay, I, I think that's uh, going to close close uh, the end of this session because we're going to hear from Craig LeFay. So, if I can ask you to thank our excellent speakers, Kathleen Chell, Emma Markham, Shreya <laughs> and Thomas Anker.